Okay, welcome uh, and have a great afternoon. Um, Milan over here and I myself will be taking you uh, into the world of spatial data management in SQL Server 2012. Hi everyone. Um, Milan has been working on the spatial uh, functionality for, the la for basically all of 2008 R2 and 2012. Right. And uh, he is kind of our um, spatial team expert. He's from the Serbia development team, so he's local. I'm Michael Rees. I have been working on the spatial stuff in 2008 on spatial indexing and also was the scenario owner for unstructured and beyond relational data that includes uh, spatial data as well. So let's start and uh, really dive into that world. Um, our objectives and takeaways for you guys are that uh, you basically will have an understanding of what are the spatial capabilities of SQL Server 2012 uh, and you will kind of at least know that there is something that helps you optimize the spatial queries. I have a 400 level deep dive session tomorrow about optimizing spatial uh, queries using spatial indices where I go into excruciating details on how the spatial indexing works and how you can use it to tune your queries. So if you uh, are interested in that topic, I uh, highly recommend the session tomorrow. Uh, the key takeaway basically that we want to kind of take home uh, back to your uh, companies and uh, friends and coworkers is that if you have a spatial issue, SQL Server 2012 gives you a comprehensive and easy to use offering to actually solve your spatial issues. So that's kind of the takeaway. So why are we actually adding spatial data type support to SQL Server? Actually, we were kind of late to the game. Many of our competitors already had spatial support for a while, but many of them were like targeting the high-end uh, market of people that are like building GIS applications, etc. Um, and that was a pretty small market, and it was not that interesting for us to have highly complex features in the database that nobody can use. However, over the last five to ten years, there has been a plethora of devices that give you basically geospatial information and more and more problems have a much better um, visualization, a much more insightful treatment of data if you add spatial dimension to the data. So there's more data sources, there's more kinds of data and you basically start mixing and matching them and so basically you're going to get much more out of your spatial data than you got out let's say five or ten years ago. So let's start and show you a little bit what you can do with spatial inside SQL Server. So, okay, uh, so uh, this is probably the picture that everybody recognized who needed a map to get here. Uh, so this is the surrounding area, some of the streets, and uh, Rai is somewhere over here in the middle. And uh, I'm just showing now the result of the spatial query, and uh, I'm going to get into details about how we constructed this image. So this image is essentially some of the spatial objects uh, that we borrowed from the Navtech database uh, for Netherlands. And uh, what we're seeing here is a spatial vis vis visualization tab inside the SSMS, which you get when you execute the query that has the spatial data in it so that you can visualize the data. So this is uh, what, so, so this is the rye with streets and some dots around it within a certain uh, distance from the rye? Yes, so uh, here we are, uh, essentially have the query that shows the uh, old spatial objects that we have in the database that are one kilometer around the uh, rye. Okay, so let's look at the query. Yeah, so uh, if you use that uh, database first, I'm just gonna quickly show you what kind of uh, tables we have over there. So first one is a table that contains all the streets and I'm showing here only first top uh, 500. And, and you noticed um, bicycle lanes in the Netherlands are highways. Yes. As everybody walking around in the city probably noticed. Right? So yes. So again, by executing the query I got a spatial tab and now I, I can see this is the, just a part of the entire data set but it's just huge, so I'm just showing one uh, part. And uh, on the right side, we have uh, additional options uh, that we can uh, change the visualization. So for example, I can put the uh, label on all the objects, we, in, which are in this case the names of the streets. So I can choose 
any of the columns that I returned as part of my spatial query. And we, we see all the columns run here. So okay, first I have the uh, table with all the streets. So every color, uh, every different color, this every line is a separate object in the database. And then uh, after that, I have the, another table, which is the points of interest in the entire Netherlands. So again, I'll just show the first 500 objects. And you can see these are uh, objects scattered around you. At this point, you need to trust me that they're in the Netherlands. And, but we can see that we have category, name, and then the third column over here, you can see it, uh, it's uh, the spatial object that we retrieved from the database. And now to get to the previous image, which is all the objects uh, around the right, um, we can do that uh, with the following. So first thing that I did is I read the GPS coordinate of this location from my cell phone and I insert it here. So what this first line does, it just constructs the simple spa uh, geography object. Geography is the spatial data type with these coordinates. And then I'm using uh, that object to query the data from the uh, two tables that I selected. So I have qu quite large query here, but the query is uh, essentially uh, a couple of smaller queries uh, combined together to to provide a nice visualization. So, so first, so if you look at, for example, Bing, when you have Bing, you have like different layers of objects that you put on top. So this is kind of the same principle. Each query is basically a layer, and you union them all together, and so you're kind of adding them on top of each other. Exactly. So uh, first part of query will uh, select all the uh, streets that uh, have distance less than 1,000 meters, so this number is in meters. And then I'll combine the result from the points of interest uh, that are uh, of category uh, that are tourist places. And then I'll combine all of that with the points of interest that are of category type uh, eating, which are essentially restaurants. And in the end, I'll use the uh, starting point that I defined, and I'll do just the buffer uh, of 1,000 meters, and I'll do buffer with curves, which is a new method, and you will find out shortly what it exactly does to just uh, complete the image. And I'm going to execute that again to show the image. So uh, what, what they just didn't say, so uh, for the restaurants and for the tourist places, I put the... Uh, different size of the buffer around the points in the query just to make the difference between the two. So you can see there are a couple of restaurants, other uh, tourist points of interest, and then all the streets. And the big circle, well, it's not circle here because this is the, the, the projected uh, space, but if I change the projection to Merc Mercator, you can see that it's a circle, which represents my targeted query of one kilometer around the position where we are today. And that, that's one type of query that you can do with spatial. Essentially, give me all the objects within a certain distance from some location. Another type that you can do is uh, so-called nearest neighbor. So I'll use the same uh, starting point like for the previous query. And I'll construct the query uh, slightly differently by using the top uh, clause and then order by distance. So what will that give me? I don't need to specify in advance the range I want the spatial objects. I'm simply saying I want the closest 20 objects from this location. And I'm, again, just combining the spatial query with non-spatial predicate so, so that you can see that uh, spatial queries can be combined with uh, essentially everything else. When I execute that, You can see here uh, that I got the oops, so points of interest around me. So, so, so the closest one, because I ordered it by distance, and I put it, the distance column there. So you can see the rise is essentially the closest to us. And we have uh, other points of interest, uh, bus stops, tram stops, and so on. So th the last one, the 20th, is, uh, as we can see around here, uh, 500 meters away. And uh, just to uh, quickly say that 
uh, these two tables that, that we have right now are quite large. So points of interest has 180,000 points for entire Netherlands. And the, the street uh, table of all the streets has 1.5 million rows. And as you can see, we were able to get the results pretty quickly from this data set. Thanks, Milan. Uh, so as you have seen, there's kind of lots of cool things that you can do. Now, there are a few, a lot of spatial scenarios where you want to have uh, spatial data used. I mean, real estate development, obviously, maps, environmental impact studies, financial data, even like market analysis, etc. And I know at least one person in the room here who is selling uh, spatial data for, for example, doing uh, business analysis and so on. So there's a lot of uh, potential in this context uh, for doing spatial data processing. Now, there are fundamentally two types of spatial data. Um, one is raster data, and the other one is vector data. And the vector data is basically what you have just seen. It's basically points, multipoints, line strings, multi-line strings, polygons, uh, collections of all the above, etc. This is kind of the stuff that we are supporting with our spatial data type. Uh, the second thing is raster data. Think maps, satellite imageries, etc. These kind of uh, data structures we can store inside SQL Server as a blob, like our binary max, but we don't have any knowledge about any of the features inside the blob. So we don't know that this thing is a, is a this grayish thing is a road. This is just not part of the semantic. Another so way, another way we, uh, you will not be able to do the spatial operations on raster data. Exactly. So we can't do spatial operations on raster data. The data that we have is all vector data. Now, in SQL Server 2008, we basically had the type of data that I just showed you. In 2012, we are adding new capabilities. Uh, one of the new stuff that we add is uh, circular arc support. That means now um, you can actually represent arcs and circles with much, much less data and with much higher precision than you could do with uh, SQL Server 2008 um, kind of line strings where you have lots of dots then that kind of follow the curve. The, these features are, of course, supported by all the methods that we had before. So if you do a buffer, we can actually create a buffer. In addition, we actually can create buffers that have curves around it. That was shown earlier when we did that circle around uh, the right. And uh, so that, of course, means that we are now using much less space for these types of objects. And uh, the other thing, and this is a first, I think, among the commercial database vendors, is that you can now take these circular arcs and not only use them on two-dimensional flat data, but also two-dimensional geoidal data, meaning that it actually adapts to the curvature of the Earth. And we'll so see some examples later uh, in the demos. Um, other things that we have done compared to SQL Server 2008 is that we added new methods to the geography type that were missing in 2008, uh, either because we didn't get to it so that we matched to, uh, the geometry type or because we have new methods, of course, because of some of the new functionality that we have added, the new features that we have added, or because people have asked us to add some features. And we'll see that uh, later as well. Another important aspect is that um, in the spatial objects that you are getting sometimes are invalid. What does invalid mean? Well, for example, if you have a polygon, if lines cross, then that's considered to be an invalid object. And then there are like methods of like making it into a valid object. And, but the only way to do that is, is that you can load it and then to make valid on them. And in the geometry type, we were uh, giving you that capability in 2008. On the geography type, we are adding that now in SQL Server 2012. Another first for a commercial database system, at least as far as I know, is that our, uh, is that our objects can be bigger than a hemisphere. So that means now you can basically have a model, an object that models the ozone layer or an object that models uh, the surface uh, um, water on the Earth or all the continents, etc. something that you couldn't do before. Uh, we also increased precision from 27 to 48 bits in our spatial computation. Now, this has some um, effects, like, for example, in some edge cases, you might have some backwards compatible behavior changes. And I think there's also some other things that uh, that change gives us. Yeah, so in, in practical terms, this increase in precision uh, increases the precision from, from a meter down to a sub-millimeter for uh, the entire globe. 
So our for, resolution for all the special operations. Yeah. So the resolution of the special operations also has increased dramatically. Another thing that we added is persistent computer columns. So you can uh, now have persistent computer columns of, uh, on a spatial method and a spatial data type, either producing a spatial data type or extracting information out of it. Uh, and then you can, of course, define a spatial index on top of that. And we have spatial aggregators uh, that we will show you in a minute. And we have also a couple of new indexing features that we will uh, hint at and then go into more detail tomorrow. Um, so you have already seen how to create spatial objects. So the easiest one is you basically have a latitude and longitude position and you just pass it in as a parameter to the constructor. And then you can add buffers around it. You can do queries that we have shown earlier. Um, you can do distance queries. You can even relate two objects with each other using the intersection. Now, these operations are available on two types. The reason why we have two types is because we couldn't make up our mind whether the Earth was flat or round, basically. So one, the first type is the geography type. That's the geoidal, that's the type that assumes the Earth is round. There is no projection happening, and we basically store ellipsoidal um, coordinates for that, so longitude and latitude. In addition, we store also elevation and M, which is milepost indication. Now, operationally, we will not use either of those. So if you do a distance between the Mariana Trench and the uh, Mount Everest top, uh, we are not going to take the minus 10 kilometers plus 9 kilometers distance uh, into, our dis uh, into our distance. It's just mapped down to the flatness of the Earth. So that's something that we are not supporting yet. Um, now, what this type does is it basically assumes that there is a model that describes the Earth's shape. And so, and everything is located on top. The geometry data type is uh, not only for the flat Earth society, but it's also for the people that use existing um, surveying data that has been produced over the last three to 400 years. Most of these surveyors didn't know, didn't have GPS devices, didn't actually know exactly how to model the curvature of the Earth. So what they did was they devised elaborate schemes on how to map each point onto uh, basically a uh, two-dimensional space. It's also, of course, useful for things like, for example, modeling this uh, conference center in small-scale environments. The difference between these two types might not be as, as big, and it's easier to do Euclid uh, operations on the geometry type than the more complex uh, geodetic uh, operations on the geography type. So just give you a quick uh, kind of hint. Let's assume I'm Columbus, and I have, and people are arguing whether he had a map or not. Let's assume he had a map, and it was a map that was using Mercator projection, which came about uh, 70 years later. But in that case, if I assume the Earth is flat, I take my distance from Spain, where I left, to uh, the new promised land of uh, China, um, and I calculate it and measure it. If I do that, I would assume, okay, I need that much provision, that much water, etc. But actually, the actual arc that I travel is this arc. So you can imagine what will happen. I will run out of food, I will run out of water, and I will get a mutiny. And if you look at history, that's almost what happened. So uh, that's kind of a, probably a proof that he used to have a map to get there. <coughs> so this is important in long distances, using the right model, either the right projection or the right uh, model in terms of uh, geodetic versus uh, flat Earth is important. Now in terms of spatial data types, you have seen some like line strings and points. This is a simple polygon. So it's very easy to format them and we support a couple of different representations for that document. So when he ran the query, when uh, Milan ran the query inside SQL Server, you saw the column as kind of this binary string. That binary string is the SQL Server internal representation. Now there's also another binary representation that is called well-known binary that we support for both for output and for input. Now, anyone knows why this is well-known? I don't know. So, I mean, if I look at this, I can't devise what, what the binary really means. Now, there's another well-known text format, which is a little bit easier to understand. And these are basically both are standardized by the um, OGC standard for uh, geospatial data. And then we also have an XML representation called GML, which again is an OGC-specified uh, standard format that gives you the necessary format. 
We do not currently directly support KML, which is the Google uh, spatial format, but it's very easy to extend our spatial library with what we call a builder interface to kind of support that or um, just transform it from one of these formats. Uh, it's very simple to do. Now we also support more complicated polygons. This is uh, a polygon that describes a wetland in, uh, I think, British Columbia in Canada. Now this object is uh, approximately 600 megabytes big inside the database, or 600 kilobytes big in the, inside the database, and has about 40,000 points in it. Now this is a very complex object. Uh, we actually have some of our competitors are not able to represent that in, as, as a single object. And now you can imagine if you have to do an intersection with this object with something else, that's going to become quite complex. Yeah. And here's just to visualize how this looks like, and this is just like the beginning. So this is a geometry collection of polygon, line strings, etc., etc. So it's quite a complex object. So now let's switch back and uh, take a look at some more details what uh, we actually support in code. Yeah, so I have here another uh, database. Uh, and I have first the table with the time zone. So I'll show that in a second. So here we have the polygons represent uh, all different time zones. and. Uh, as Michael noted, a SQL Server 2012 is, uh, can represent objects that are bigger than a hemisphere, and all these time zones are bigger than a hemisphere. So in SQL uh, 2008, or with uh, any competitors, you won't, would not be able to pre represent these objects on a geodetic, yeah. um, as a geodetic type. So this is like an equi-rectangular um, visualization. Maybe we can yes. like make it look and more can, like an Earth. Yeah, so. on, or Robinson or Bond projection. So this is not projected. This is uh, stored as a geography type. And the projection is done by the visualization tool. Yes. And then we have the uh, list of the countries in the world. So that's another table. And I'll show that quickly as well. So th this is stored as geography as well. And some of the uh, countries are quite large. And some of them are like Russia, uh, I don't think that can fit in a logical hemisphere. So the, here as well, we have the objects that are bigger than hemisphere and then just showing the different projection that uh, how th this looks like. And then it's quite easy to do, um, the, we can combine the two and for example, answer the questions, what are the uh, countries that are in GMT plus one time zone? Which is the one that we are in. So we know that we can call the people there without waking them up. <laughs> yes. So uh, what we need to do is some, something that is called a spatial join. So, so we select the data from both um, tables. And then uh, we essentially uh, have the countries. And we have the time zones. And we are saying, OK, let's return all the countries that are in the time zone that has the, the zone plus one. And we are doing just a little buffer around the, the time zone to include the entire countries. And if you look at the result, so these are all the, the let's say, objects that are, uh, have any part of them uh, in the time zone GMT plus one. I can uh, change, and you can notice that I use the ST intersects method. I can tr uh, change that to be ST contains. And uh, we will get only the objects that are co completely contained within the time zone. So I'm now going to include the uh, one more query, which is just that time zone, so that we can see the result. And now, you can see uh, there is a time zone, and we see uh, all the objects. Plus, we excluded all the objects that are bigger, like Russia or Antarctica, that do not fit entirely in, in this time zone. OK, cool. So let's um, also go back and uh, continue with the presentation here. So one of the new things that we've added was circle arcs. I already mentioned that. And uh, circle arcs are basically just, again, sub-features like line strings in T-SQL inside the types. 
So in this example, for example, you have a circle string which describes a circle around uh, the North Pole. And you can make that circle, of course, also into a polygon if you want to. Now, there's an interesting question um, in the sense of um, how do you actually um, order the objects? Like in SQL Server 2008, if I gave the order of the points in the wrong direction, I would say, sorry, that's the wrong direction. You can't do that anymore. In SQL Server 2012 now, the order of the points decide whether we describe the area within, if I have a polygon, or outside of that line string. So, and the order is basically what we call the left foot rule for exterior rings, which is kind of describing which order we have to put the dots in to make sure that we describe the inside or the outside. Now, <coughs> I think we can go back and show some of the examples here yeah, uh, so in T-SQL. I just wanted to show a, a couple of examples how we can you know, play with the circular arcs for, for a minute. So uh, this is what uh, Michael mentioned, the uh, uh, well-known text representation of the objects. And we can quite easily construct uh, the new uh, geography objects from the well-known uh, well text representation by using stgm from text method. And by executing that, uh, I'll show quickly. So we get a nice circular arc. So for constructing circular arcs, we need to specify three points. So uh, x and y are a latitude and a longitude for the first point, the second point, and the third point. Uh, easily, we can combine line strings and circular arcs into a single object. And for that, we need to use compound curve. And within a compound curve, for example, first we have the line string, and then followed by the circular arc, and then followed by the second line string and then a circular arc again. And so you notice that the people in the standards group were lazy. They didn't add line string, uh, but they make you write uh, circular arcs. Yes, and this is how the, the object looks like. And again, re the reminder is uh, it doesn't matter how you construct a spatial object. You can use all the spatial methods on any type of spatial object. So for example, now if you want to fill the, um, um, this uh, spatial object, uh, we can construct a curved polygon out of this compound curve. And we can do that, that just by uh, wrapping the compound curve with the curved polygon uh, keyword. And by constructing this, uh, we get a nice polygon that has the boundary defined by the compound curve. Uh, so uh, Michael mentioned uh, earlier the difference between the line string and the uh, uh, circular arcs. Now it's difficult to understand uh, uh, how that behaves on the globe, but uh, I can try to explain to them here. So I'm uh, just I constructed two uh, objects. One is circular arcs, and the other is a, a line string with exactly the same points. Just to see the difference. So uh, the one that is a shown here, here as a straight line is actually a circular arc, like in the uh, example of Columbus. Yes. So that's uh, maybe changes line, uh, the projection. Right. And it will be clear when we change the projection. So the one, um, so this one is the uh, line string, and the one object that follows the uh, latitude line is a circular arc. So that's essentially what Michael was trying to explain the difference with, between the circular arcs and line strings because line strings follow the, the shortest path between the two points while circular arcs define the equal distance of all three points from the imaginary center. Yes. And I think it's very important to notice here that of course if depending on which one of these two you choose for for example during an intersection if that's a polygon shape then you might or might not uh, include certain objects that you are interested in. Right, and uh, so to, to show that, I, I just converted these two objects to polygon and curved polygon. Um, and now we can use them in a special operation. So for example, let's do the inter intersection between the two objects. So now I have the polygon and then intersection with the curved polygon that is defined by the circular arc. And first I'm just gonna select the part of the query that returns the spatial result. And you see that I have the objects that have all the um, 
uh, basically the non-match, non-overlapping parts have been cut off. Yes. And now I, I wanted to, to show the text representation. We can do that by including the STS text method. And as you can see here, so we um, taking into account the, where are the circular arcs and resulting objects have the circular arcs as well. Meaning that we cut the circular arcs on, on the spots where it intersect with the line string and we continue with the line string. Meaning that the overall uh, size of the objects will remi remain small. We will not uh, approximate a circular arc with a large number of points. So that you can combine uh, these uh, uh, lines and circular arcs with the operations and still get the small objects uh, without increasing the number of points in the result. Yeah. Another uh, quite interesting method that we added is uh, called the shortest line two. To understand what shortest line two does, um, I'm going to construct one line string and one polygon. And shortest line two returns the line string between the two objects. So I have the line string and the triangle and and, and this line string represents the shortest line between the two objects. Now, both yeah. of you also notice maybe that the line string that we gave above only had the beginning and end point. So the actual point that it calculates for the shortest line is not necessarily aligned with any of the points that you have given for the object. Yes. So, for example, this method is quite useful if you have the uh, your your current position or proposition of some object and you want to find the nearest road or nearest street that is cl close around and find the point on that road that, that you can align the, the, the position to. Okay? So let's so go back. Let's and uh, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the um, spatial operations. So you have seen already quite a few of spatial operations uh, and so on. There are a couple of different types of spatial operations. Uh, some are static like the constructions that had the colon colon notation. These are static methods on the type itself that allow you to create new objects. On the other hand, we also have normal, normal operations like, for example, as the intersect. And I think the important aspect here is it's really um, just CLR type method invocation on the type completely embedded into T-SQL. Actually, the whole spatial library except for the spatial indexing was implemented using the CLR uh, extensibility that we have in SQL Server 2005. The only thing that is database specific is the spatial indexing itself. Everything else can also be downloaded as a library and you can use it in your normal C Sharp uh, .NET projects and uh, build your own GIS based solution or take the data that you get off the database and do further processing with the exactly same uh, experience as in the database. So the type of spatial operations that we have are we have uh, the composition operations that we've seen, like union intersection that take two objects and basically merge them into a new one. We have the comparison operations, like as the intersects contains that you use inside predicates to see whether something is true or false. You have construction, like the shortest line two that you have seen, or the SD buffer that takes an object, adds some parameters to it, and creates a new one. And you have numerical operations. Like that basically give you distance or length of the object, etc. Then you have the properties like what is the coordinate point of a specific uh, item as well. Now, some of the methods um, that we mentioned, um, we now are having new in SQL Server 2012. We added a f all the curve-related objects, the shortest line to, and some compatibility aspects new to both of the types, geometry and geography. And the geography type, we added uh, quite a few of the operations that were missing in 2008 and now we basically have feature parity between the two except for some of the methods that are very specific to being on a geoid versus being on flat earth. So you now have make valid in both, you have within in both, you have overlaps in both, etc. We also have a new method that allows us to um, basically reorient the shape that we have. So I talked about that we have the ability to like have full globe objects and that the order of the coordinate system is important. So what is if I get it the wrong way around? Well, don't uh, fret. You basically can just do uh, reorient. So in this case, I have <coughs> a line string that kind of goes over Europe here into Russia and um, I put a buffer around it with curves. 
So this is kind of how it looks like now, so that the two endpoints now, instead of having lots of small dots, is basically each a circular arc segment. Now, if I want to go and basically reorient it, basically say, well, I didn't mean to show everything that lives across Europe. I want, actually want to show the inverse of it. And we have now the reorient method that gives us the ability to just select everything outside that corresponding area. <coughs> so we will actually see an interesting example in one of the demos that uh, are coming up to actually make use of that. So I'm switching back to uh, Milan for more demos. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, so... <coughs> okay. Um, so this is not working. Can you all hear me? So while he is uh, fixing that, um, so we are going back to our world uh, database. And what we're going to show you is basically some of the new aggregate functions and also how we actually can combine everything that we have seen so far into some really interesting, more complex queries. Yeah. So I you need to put it higher up, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, just use mine. Okay. Uh, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, so I already showed that we have the table of all the countries in the world. Now, wh oh, what I will do here is produce the union of all the objects, all the countries in the world. And I do that by using geography and that uh, union aggregate. And it's used like any other aggregate in, within the SQL, like sum, average, and so on. And I'm just uh, using the reduce method to reduce the number of points because, as you will see, this object will be quite large and we need to visualize it. So uh, I need to reduce the number of points just to be able to visualize. Now, when I execute this query, and I'll switch to the spatial results tab, you see uh, this is now one single object. Now, uh, that is a, a combination of m multiple polygons and one, the, the largest one is a uh, polygon that covers entire Asia, Africa, and Europe. And so and this is definitely an object that is way bigger than an hemisphere. Yes, and uh, this object is big not, not just by the area, but also by the number of points. So I'll just quickly go here and execute the, the same query, just I wanted to show uh, size of the objects and number of points that it contains. So data length is the binary size of the object as if you would store it inside the database. And as you can see, it's uh, fairly large. It's, um, over, uh, it's two me over 2.7 megabytes. And he has like 169,000 points. And so uh, we have other type of aggregates. I'll switch back to the Netherlands database and the points of interest that I uh, show quickly on the beginning. So we can do all kinds of different aggregates, convex hull and envelope aggregate. So I'll just execute a query that combines all of these so that you can see the difference and with the original uh, points of interest. So I'm just filtering out the, the business points of interest. And as you can see here, we have all the points of interest of type business and then the Polygon, convex polygon is a result of the convex hull aggregate. And the large circle is the result of the envelope aggregate. Now, the difference between geometry and geography is that for geometry, we have a Cartesian coordinate system. And the envelope aggregate is a rectangle, bond, uh, a bounding box. But for geography, we don't have a uh, Cartesian coordinate system. So the only thing we can do is produce the circle that represents the, the, the boundary of all the objects within. And now, um, you can probably ask the question, like, all of these, we have uh, a lot of new methods. We can work with uh, objects that are bigger than a hemisphere. We have the reorient object, like Michael yeah. mentioned. Uh, I want to show you one uh, use case where all of these methods can be combined to produce something, new query, new result, that. Uh, was not able before. So I have a new uh, table here which represents the cities uh, around the, the world. And I'll just show them quickly here. 
So you can see a lot of small dots representing each one in, uh, representing individual city in the world. So if you squint, you can kind of see the <laughs> continents again. Yes. And let's imagine that I want to uh, get a list of all the cities that are coastal cities, meaning close to the shore of the ocean or, or the sea. Now, what do you think, Michael? How should we do this? Well, I, I would say that I probably uh, find the water mass of the Earth and then do a distance for whatever distance I want to the cities to identify those cities, no? Yeah, it, that, that's pretty good and close to the solution. That so wasn't like reversed or anything. <laughs> so uh, I already show how we can do the union of all the countries and that will pr produce all the land mass in the, in the world. And by using the reorient object, we can uh, re uh, reorient that landmass to produce all the water in the world. Now, if I select the first part of my query, and uh, again, I'm just reducing because of the visualization so that we can visualize. You see that I have the uh, result, which is all the water around the world. And then the only thing I, I'm, I'm missing here is just uh, select all the cities that are within some distance tolerance that have the downtown uh, center area from, from the, this water mass. And I'm specifying here 20 kilometers as the distance. Now, if I execute the entire query, so the second part is just um, a, a simple distance query. Uh, again, I have the, all, all the water and then again, you can see that we selected only the cities that are close to the Clo uh, close to the edge, see of around water, here, yeah. yeah, of the water. So again, uh, the, we wanted to produce uh, with SQL Server 2012 the spatial library where you can just store all the data and uh, figure out later on how you want to combine the data to answer new business uh, cases. Because uh, to answer something like this previously, you would need to know in advance that you would like to answer these type of questions. And now you can just store all the data and try to play with it later on to understand and get the, the, the new business scenarios. Yes, thanks. Uh, so let's go and uh, kind of repeat some of the stuff and get to, to some new stuff as well. So we have now seen what are the operations uh, that you can do on spatial data. Now, of course, the operations are not worth anything unless we have spatial data to play with. And so let's look, take a look a little bit at where we can get spatial data from. The easiest way, of course, we already have shown you is you take your latitude and longitude and you store it inside the database. Now, here are two ways. Even if you already have existing longitude and latitude information inside your database stored relationally, you, for example, can either have a persistent computed column or you add a new column and then you basically update it with the reference to those longitude and latitude data. So that's an easy way of taking non -spati spatial, non-geospatial data and transfer it into a geospatial data type. Um, one thing that you notice, let me quickly point out, you see there this number, 4326. Now this is one of these matching numbers, also well known to everybody who does geospatial data, in the sense that this is what's called an SRID. And every spatial object has an SRID associated with it. Now, what does SRID mean? Well, an SRID is a spatial reference ID. And what it is, it's basically the locale for the spatial object. Similar to a collation is the locale for a string object. So what does it identify? Well, it determines the coordinate system. It determines what measurements you're using, whether you're using Milan's foot, my foot, your foot, or a meter. And it's also using to describe the projection semantics if you have a flat earth kind of, if you have a two-dimensional um, thing, it might say this data was geospatial, but we used the Mercator projection to map it down or the Bond projection to map it down. And if it's a geography type, it actually encapsulates the geoid dimensional information in that SRID. Now, why is that important? Well, not everybody has the same understanding of how the Earth looks like because people want to have different resolutions different emphasis on different areas, <coughs> which leads to different of these dimensions. Now, one thing that we did was we basically said only objects of the same SRID can be operationally combined. So we are not doing 
feed to meter translations. That's something you would have to do yourself or use an external package. The other thing is, if you're trying to combine objects with the same SRID, we are not raising an error, but we are returning null for that operation. Also, now, if you look at the two types, the SRID have different semantic implications on these two types. In the case of the geography type, <coughs> the SRID actually impacts the operational semantics. That means because each of these operations, like distance calculations, intersections, etc., are dependent upon the format of the geoid, each one of the operations actually will be following whatever the um, semantics of the SRID implies. Because of that, we only support predefined SRIDs. There are 390 SRIDs that we supported since SQL Server 2008. They are defined by, not surprisingly, one of the biggest interests in that space, a European Petroleum Survey Group, which basically use different of these systems to basically determine uh, their coordinate systems when they go exploring for oil and other resources. The default is the so-called WGS84 um, SRID 4326. Now, what is that? That's actually the um, SRID that is uh, assigned and associated with the uh, GPS satellites that the US have, has in orbit. The uh, Galileo uh, GPS system, for example, will have their own SRID because they have a slightly different assumption on how the curvature of the Earth is functioning. Uh, in SQL Server 2012, we added one more SRID, um, which is Microsoft specific. Uh, so it's us and not the EPSG uh, that specifies that. That is specifying uh, a spherical globe and unit sphere that is using uh, a much simpler mathematical model of how the Earth looks like. Now, the reason why we did that is twofold. One, Bing is using the same kind of simplified assumption about how the Earth looks like, so it makes it in the edge case, easier to integrate Bing data with SQL Server data and that vice versa. The second reason is, is that the operational semantics for complex um, mathematical operations is simpler. So if you are really, really uh, performance oriented, you will want to use this potentially if you can live with the kind of slight differences to, for example, WGS84. Now, in the case of the SRID for geometry data, Actually, the default is zero, and there is no use, uh, semantic implication in terms of operation. Everything is Euclid, so it doesn't matter if you do Euclid in meters or feet. It's still giving you the same mathematical background. I think we can quickly switch over, and Milan can kind of show you how to actually get at the SRIDs in the system. Yeah. So before I do that, I just want to, to mention here, so for example, in the previous query, I used the distance less than 20,000, and that is 20,000 meters. And how we know that it's 20,000 meters and not 20,000 foot? Well, that depends on the SRID of the special objects used here and here. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to select uh, all the uh, reference IDs that, that we uh, support. So you, you see the list of all of them and the ID that you can use for geometry. And there is uh, 391 of them. And for mo all of them, you have the units of measure. Now, I, I can select just the ones that don't have meter as a unit of measure. And you can see that there are a couple of them using Clark foot, Indian foot, German legal. Yeah, so as you can see, Germans are very precise. They are actually big. Their meter is bigger than the other meter. <laughs> and yes. uh, everybody has its own foot size. Yes. Apparently. And uh, down uh, the last one, you can see the uh, SRID that we added, which is a, a unit sphere. And if I uh, quickly go here, you will see that the unit of measure for them is in angles. So if if you're using distance measurement or anything else, you have, and you're using unit sphere, you need to, to provide the values in angles. So it's quite useful for scientists, astronomy. Plus, if you want uh, your spatial operations to perform faster, you can use this uh, unit sphere because mathematical model is quite simpler and quite faster to compute. Okay, thanks. So. Once we have the spatial data, there's also, of course, 
external ways of uh, accessing spatial data. Uh, one of the most frequently stored geospatial data inside your database is actually not in geometry or geography type. It's normally in a set of um, columns that encode your address. So one thing that you want to do often is you want to take an address and basically map it into a geographical point. Now, SQL Server itself does not provide that service, uh, but there are so-called geocoder services out there. I have a couple of here listed. Some of them are limited in space, some of them uh, in terms of how many requests you can do for free, some of them require money, some of them are uh, more lenient in allowing you to have uh, several data, and some of them are providing actually whole end-to-end -end packages like ESRI, for example, to allow you to do that. And uh, basically, uh, one way of integrating that into SQL Server, for example, is, is either through an SSISI process that you get the data out, you pipe it through and load the data back in, or you use uh, CLR store procedures where you basically make calls um, through the web APIs to go and uh, get the data back from those services. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can generate your own. So we already talked about GPS devices, cameras, phones, etc. There are also tools online that allow you to, for example, build things. Uh, so the Bing Maps, for example, has, a, has an extension that has some tools in there that allow you to like, uh, create uh, coordinate systems and shapes. Uh, there used to be, I couldn't find it uh, this week anymore, there used to be a spatial wiki uh, that actually allowed you to do that as well. I'm not quite sure where that went. Uh, I'm kind of uh, searching that at the moment. Um, so that kind of gives you the ability. Of course, you can also take existing spatial data and create new spatial data. You have seen that frequently us doing now with our aggregation. We've shown you three of the four aggregators here. We didn't show you the collection aggregate because that's just kind of moving things into one collection. So it's a little bit more uh, boring in terms of what it does. Now you can also get additional data. And there are different ways of getting that additional data. Uh, one is you go and ask your local government. <clears throat> now many of the local governments in uh, certain countries will give you that information for free. So for example, in the US, you can go to geo.data.gov or data.gov to get your uh, geospatial data. Um, others like the um, British uh, Ordnance um, Registry or whatever it's called, they recently finally made their uh, data available at least uh, to some extent for free as well. Uh, previously, you had to pay for it. Certain countries, uh, you might not get much data because they feel it's a state secret how their roads look like, etc. You can also buy it. There are lots of vendors out there, ESRI, Bitnibos, Navtech, which was uh, providing us with the set of data that we were using, Teleatlas, and there's a whole set of data sets on datamarket.azure.com as well, and some other places. There are lots of places where you can find them. Now, once we have that external data, most of that external data comes in different shapes. Some of it comes in any one of these well-known formats that I shown you earlier. Some of them might come actually in a SQL Server database. And a few come in what's called shapefiles. Now, shapefiles are, is a data format that is very standard and very good for people to kind of uh, know if they use things like ESRI, uh, ArcGIS systems, etc. So it has become a kind of a de facto standard. So now, how do I load a shapefile uh, into the database? Well, we don't provide a shapefile loader out of the box. But there are, again, lots of add-ins and interesting tools that help you do that. Uh, one that I will be demoing in a minute is shape to sql It's a free, downloadable um, loader from sharpjs.net that was completely built using our SQL Server Spatial Library and its internal builder interface that allows you to basically programmatically build up complex uh, spatial objects. Um, and the nice thing about that is it doesn't need to be in the same database. It's uh, very simple. It's free. It's not open source, though. Uh, then we have a map point add-in for SQL Server, um, which is a free download. However, it needs Microsoft map point, uh, for which I think a free trial is available. And then we have um, kind of the more really hardcore commercial systems. And here we have uh, three mentioned uh, on, the, on the slide. And no, I'm not getting any kickbacks, uh, which is safe software's uh, feature manipulation engine, which is kind of uh, one of the Rolls Royce in that area. They know everything and do everything. And recently for SQL Server 2012's launch, they announced a simpler, cheaper version 
that uh, can be integrated with SSIS that is uh, very useful uh, to basically do data loading. And then we have ESRI ArcGIS, of course, which is kind of the granddaddy of them all, and Pitney Bowes uh, Easy Loader. So let me go and quickly show you how I actually do uh, that loading. So let me uh, start the Shape to SQL program here. So what I've done is I kind of, uh, I'm paranoid. I'm afraid of getting flu, uh, bird flu. And I found some H1N1 data. Now the data is a little bit old, so uh, bear with me for the storyline here. And um, I basically found that shape file online, and the URL is in, uh, in the, in the uh, description here. And um, it contains almost 9,000 points. Now, I'm going to load that into my database here. So let me quickly zoom in so you kind of see that in a little bit more detail. And I'm basically going to um, replace an existing table. This is planar geometry data, and I will not create a spatial index. I will remove that. I will give the table name, and then I basically select which columns I want to use and what the name of the geometry data type is. So let's unselect the spatial index here. Uh, let's unselect the ID here. You didn't unselect the ID. Oops. Thank you. Now I update it. So now this is loading the data. As you can see, it's going fairly quickly. Now, however, since we only have uh, 19 minutes left, I already created, uh, loaded the database, and I have it here. And I actually transferred this database into a geometry, uh, into a geography type again, just for my, my kind of uh, visual, visualization in some of the queries I'm going to do. Now, as you can see, again, there are about uh, 9,000 uh, rows here. And um, there's lots of data here about uh, the whole world. If I go and visualize it, you will notice that first, our visualization tool actually will only display the first 5,000 objects. So if you want to show more, then you basically have to build uh, outside or use the reporting services uh, integration in SQL Server 2008 R2 that allows you to do the visualization of much more. And that also gives you control over the colors, et cetera, that you want to visualize. And as you can see, it's kind of lots of dots everywhere all over the world. So let's go back here and do some interesting uh, queries. So what I would like to do is I basically would like to know how does it look like here in Europe in terms of H1N1 um, things. And in particular, I'm interested in the Benelux uh, countries, which is uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, and France and Germany. So I basically just do that query, and again, this is a very simple query, no spatial predicate whatsoever. I just do a buffer to make it a little bit more visually pleasing. And you can see there are about um, 158 uh, incidents, and it kind of looks scattered here. It's not really visually pleasing and so on. So let's look at some additional kind of information. Now, I happen to have the world database that we have shown, seen earlier, and I've created a view that contains all the European countries that either use the Euro, the Swiss franc, because I'm Swiss, and the um, Serbian dinar, because Milan is Serbian. And um, we had to do a view because there are the French and uh, Dutch and some others have lots of islands somewhere in other parts of the country, uh, in the world, that I wasn't interested in and would have uh, kind of mucked up my uh, visualization, so I excluded them in that view. So now what I do is I basically go and join my H1N1 data with all the data that has uh, with all those countries in Europe. So let's that use these currencies. So let's do the visualization. And you kind of see now, you see some clustering here. And um, let's find out what that clustering actually means by overlaying it with the actual um, data. And the other thing that you notice is that it took us about two seconds to execute. So actually that's not good because it should take way longer than that. So let me delete that index that I had and run it again. And now we can go and have lunch or dinner or have a party or so because this is taking a long time now. So this query is going to take about a minute and so therefore I, I'm basically going over and talk about a little bit how we can make that query go faster. So let me switch back here. So one of the things to make your spatial query go faster is that we define a spatial index, which unfortunately was already running earlier. 
And um, the spatial index is something that we built into SQL Server 2008 already to make your queries really fly much better. Um, it is based on uh, what we call an adaptable quad tree index that allows us to basically map down our features to several levels of granularity, uh, which then gives us the ability to basically have a more approximate query in the first time to find out what are the features that might be intersecting, that might be overlapping. And then at the end, we are basically taking um, those objects and then apply the secondary step, which is the actual operation to make sure that they are really indeed overlapping or intersecting. Now, the query operation is done cost-based. So our query optimizer is doing a cost-based decision on when to use the index and when not, which sometimes means it might not choose the index even though it should, and then you can hint the index. And I have much more detail on that basically tomorrow, so this is kind of a little bit of an advertisement as well. So now let's go back and see what I can do to make this uh, previous query go faster. So as it, just to show you how long it actually took without the index, it basically took uh, 52 seconds. So now let's go back here and create my spatial index. Now, this is a geometry t uh, geography type, so I don't have to provide a bounding box. Um, I have in my H1N1 data, it's all point data. So best practices is that we use what we call a high grid density um, tessellation. And uh, these are kind of just the technical terms to describe that we will have a lot of small cells that uh, describe the grids in which we um, partition then our spatial data in the index. And if I create that index, it's actually done quite quickly, like took less than a, a second. And now if I run the query again, and this time just to kind of show you a little bit uh, more how these uh, geographies um, relate to each other, I um, union it also with my um, other countries. And um, if I run this, you can see now I went from 52 seconds to two seconds. Now this is uh, a tremendous performance improvement. It doesn't mean that we were like really bad before because we didn't like try to optimize our operations. It's just that spatial indexing has normally a tremendous impact on how you can improve the performance on spatial objects because you're going to get much smaller set of data that you actually have to run your final operations on. Just to show you the visualization here, to kind of show how these um, countries and uh, things interact, you will actually notice down here that uh, every country has a little bit of these uh, um, spaces and you kind of see also which countries use the euro, the Swiss franc, of course, only Switzerland, or the Serbian uh, dinar, which is uh, primarily Serbia there. Um, so you can kind of see, and I think that map is still accurate um, with the euro. Uh, no, not anymore. A, who, somebody already left? Okay, fine. Anyway. So having spoken about uh, how you can, and there's much more in terms of performance. This is a list. So we added persistent computer columns, which give you performance improvements. We already talked about the new geodetic uh, SRID. We are also doing improvements in terms of how we are actually improving our implementations of our methods. So for example, spatial index creation for point data is now much faster than it used to be before. Uh, we also reduced some of the memory requirements of some of the operations and uh, did general optimizations. And there's much more on that tomorrow in tomorrow's talk as well. Um, again, the new spatial uh, support that we did, we added new auto grading. So the default um, spatial index creation in SQL Server 2012 is actually going to be more predictable than the default creation was in SQL Server 2008. And um, we now give you additional abilities to hint things like the query window grid density. And again, there's much more detail on that uh, tomorrow. Uh, spatial indices can be compressed now, both uh, in terms of row and, uh, sorry, page and, uh, and, and index compression. And we also have the uh, ability to have more index aware operations. So uh, remember at the beginning, Milan showed you that uh, nearest neighbor query where we looked for the nearest uh, kind of tourist uh, activities around uh, this center here. Um, that was basically a nearest neighbor query that would now get supported with a spatial index if there is one. Now, another thing that I want to mention at the end is 
how does spatial actually live inside the cloud? So in SQL Server 2012, you get everything that we showed you. Now we have a new, we have this other thing that is called now Windows Azure SQL Database, and I have to apologize, I'm probably still saying SQL Azure once in a while, uh, which had had spatial support since summer of 2010. So most of the spatial data that you have seen, you can actually do now also up in uh, SQL Azure or Windows Azure SQL Database. Um, however, not all of them are yet available. Um, the reason for that is, is that while now both SQL Server 2012 and our cloud database are using the same code base, um, certain features are not enabled yet up in the cloud. So because the compatibility level of the database is still kind of set to the um, SQL Server 2008 compat level. So that means that certain functionality is available in SQL Server uh, in Windows Azure SQL database that is new to SQL Server 2012 in the spatial case, but not everything. So let's look at which one are available. So basically, what is new is, is all the new methods that are uh, giving us parity with the original geometry type. We have a couple of new capabilities. Shortest line to is one thing that we looked at. We also have a more detailed investigation of what uh, valid means, et cetera. And the spatial aggregators that we have shown are already available also up in uh, the cloud. We also, some of the performance improvements like the nearest neighbor query plan, uh, the new unit sphere is also available up <coughs> in Windows Azure uh, SQL database. However, uh, for example, the new um, convex uh, um, circular arcs, for example, are not. They are not yet uh, available and they will become available once uh, the compatibility level is basically upgraded to SQL Server 2012. So to conclude, um, I think SQL Server spatial support gives you the ability to basically build really cool spatially enabled applications. Uh, we give you the geometry and geography type, so we don't care whether you are a flat earth society member or whether you are uh, somebody who likes to uh, play football with the earth. But the important aspect here is, is basically you can do both and you can use them uh, in a similar way. Uh, you can also combine your existing relational data with your spatial data and get an integrated experience and can even have integrated queries between those and you have spatial indexing to give you the necessary performance to achieve the performance goals that you require for your business uh, problems. And finally, we are not just building geospatial solutions uh, just inside the database. Um, First, we are basically integrating with the existing standards environment that exists out there using OGC uh, features. Uh, we are extending some of it of our own, but basically the things that OGC provides, we are kind of supporting. Uh, we also give you a comprehensive extensibility mechanism by extending the spatial library yourself. You can write your own CLR store procs that extend the functionality that we are providing. And it's uh, also integrated into both the SQL Server um, ecosystem by, for example, having uh, reporting services understand the spatial data type and visualize it, as well as having partners like Safe Software, uh, ESRI, and others providing solutions that then allow more uh, processing with the data inside SQL Server. So this is kind of a conclusion here. There's some related context. I already mentioned the breakout session tomorrow. Um, there are some links to further uh, presentations and uh, a white paper that talks a little bit about some work that Milan, Ed, and I did with a customer around tuning spatial point data queries where we found some interesting tips and tricks on how to make things go faster. There's also a spatial forum. And uh, Ed Kadiba, who is uh, kind of our third Mr. Spatial at Microsoft, uh, who um, has a blog where he blogs a lot about how to use the spatial data and where to get it, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a very good read. And otherwise, you can always uh, contact us either over email or Twitter. Uh, the information is given there as well. So now that we have reached the end, um, I think we are more than happy to answer any further questions that you have. And um, so just raise your hand and uh, ask questions. Otherwise, I assume we were so convincing that you are now not having any questions anymore. So the question is, do we as SQL Server do transformations between different SRIDs? And the answer to that is no, we don't. 
um, the feature manipulation engine that I mentioned, for example, has the ability to do that. Or you can write your own extension function to do that transformation. Like between the geometry type, we can't do that because we don't know what you're actually doing, what, what your semantics is. In the geography type, we probably could do that, but the uh, cost of doing that, if we hide that too much, then people will kind of figure, think, why is that so slow? And so we kind of wanted to be giving people a little bit of a forcing function to stay, uh, um, to stay clear of uh, mix and matching too many different things. Yes? Are there no plans to add the possibility around rasterization? Um, so the question was whether there's any plan to add support for raster data. Um, not at the moment. However, uh, there is a nice place on the web called connect.microsoft.com slash SQL server slash feedback where you can go and request it with a nice description of your business case. Then call up all your friends, families, and foes, and dogs, and pigs, etc., <laughs> and ask them to vote on it. And if it gets high enough, then uh, definitely it will catch our attention. And otherwise, if you have a really legitimate business reason or so, and a really cool scenario, then we'll definitely take a look at it and, and see what we can do. However, it is a little bit, I mean, it's, it's raster data is very like amorphous, so it's sometimes a little bit hard to understand what people really want to do with it. And you can build, as we mentioned earlier, you can build your own, like a, a blob type can be passed to a CLR store proc, which can do image analysis and then extract features out and represent them as spatial objects, for example. Yeah. Okay, any other question? If not, then I would like to ask you, uh, let's see, to submit the evaluation online. I hope today the internet actually is on our side. Um, I have to apologize for that. Uh, it's not my fault, but I feel embarrassed that, I'm, uh, that we haven't been able to do that uh, in the year 2012. Um, so submit it. Of course, any eval of four and five and higher is highly appreciated. Um, for everybody who has lower, I would appreciate if you could add a comment why you scored us lower, then we can improve on that and make it better next time. Thank you very much, and have a great party tonight. Thank you. And we are staying around if anybody has like private questions that they didn't want to ask in the audience.